Okay, thank you for watching my video about uh, meteor showers. I'm going to start by giving some definitions. What do we mean when we talk about a meteor shower? How does that differ from a meteor, a meteoroid, a meteorite? What causes meteor showers? The main meteor showers we have and some tips on how to observe and photograph them. Meteors, often called shooting stars, are bright streaks of light caused by a small lump of rock or metal hitting the Earth's atmosphere at a very high speed, sometimes up to 200,000 kilometres an hour. As the lump passes through the atmosphere, it gets heated by friction to a temperature of thousands of degrees and starts to glow, causing it to emit a streak of light as it moves through the atmosphere. It will then normally vaporise and disappear from view. I think it's worth stating at this point, before we go any further, exactly what we mean by a meteor, meteorite, meteoroid, etc. So we've already come across meteor. It's the light and the social associated phenomenon associated with the high speed entry of a piece of rock or metal into our atmosphere. A meteoroid is a solid object between, say, 30 microns and a metre in diameter moving in an orbit in interplanetary space. Dust is basically a small meteoroid. And if a meteoroid is large enough to hit the ground, so bigger than, let's say, a few centimetres diameter, without being completely vaporised, then that's a meteorite. A meteor stream is a group of meteoroids which have the similar orbits and the common origin, be it an asteroid or a comet. A meteor shower is a group of meteors produced when the Earth passes through a meteor stream. I'll illustrate this with the Perseids, which is probably the best known periodic meteor shower. Comet Swift-Tuttle is a long period periodic comet. It takes 133 years to orbit the Sun, varying from in its orbit from 0.95 AU to just over 50 AU. This little animation shows its orbit. Um, you can see the blue dot is the Earth. You can just about see it whizzing around the Sun. The green is Jupiter, the red Saturn and the yellow is Uranus. The inner planets aren't shown other than Earth. Its next closest approach, interestingly, will be 2126 when it reaches magnitude of 0.7. But in 4479, it will pass only 1.6 million kilometres from Earth and reach magnitude of minus 5, making it the brightest object in the sky other than the Sun and Moon. As the comet moves in its orbit, it sheds material forming a ring of debris. At the same time each year, the Earth passes through this ring of debris in orbit around the Sun. When this happens, some of the particles hit the Earth's atmosphere, and this is what causes the Perseids meteor shower. The debris ring is actually fairly wide, and the Earth first crosses it in late July and takes it to late August to get to the other side. The thickest part is this is encountered around about the 12th of August, and this is the date on which the Perseids shower is at its most prolific. And here's the sources of some of the other major meteor showers. As a general rule, the best time of day to observe any meteor shower is just before it gets light in the dawn. Um, the diagram shows the Earth passing through a debris cloud, and you can see in the hours after midnight, an observer is on the side of the Earth facing towards the Earth's direction of travel. So there are more meteoroids scooped up and enter the Earth's atmosphere. As you can see in the diagram, meteoroids enter the Earth's atmosphere in parallel paths. When this is projected onto the two-dimensional dome of the sky, then it will all appear to radiate from a particular point in the sky, B. This is the radiant. This is a little bit like looking along a long straight road. The road itself 
trees running parallel to it and structures such as power cables all appear to converge at a point in the distance. The radiant of the Perseids meteor shower lies in the constellation Perseus. And here are the radiants of some other major meteor showers. In general, they're named after the constellation the radiant is located in or the nearby bright star. One key term when talking about meteor showers is something called the zenith hourly rate, ZHR. This is the number of meteors that you would see in a truly dark sky with no light pollution. If the radiant is directly overhead and if it's an unobscured view of the entire sky. This chart here shows the ZHR for the Perseids in the 2007 meteor shower. So here's the ZHRs for the key meteor showers. Note the Quarantids have a narrow peak. The meteor stream in orbit around the Sun is quite narrow and there's very little activity either side of the date of the peak. Whereas, for example, the Perseids have a much broader peak. The population index is the increase in number of meteors we'd see if we went to a magnitude of one magnitude fainter or alternatively a decrease in the number of meteors we'd see if we moved to one magnitude brighter. If we have a limiting magnitude of five, for instance, we'd only expect to see 33 Perseids per hour. So the first thing we need to think about when viewing any meteor shower is when is it dark? If we take the region of Northern England where I live, an example of the Perseids, full darkness ends just after 3 a.m. on the night of the 12th, 13th of August. In rural locations, by 4 a.m. the sky will be noticeably lighter and you'll see fewer meteors. Another thing we need to consider is the moon's rising and setting times. If we take the example of the Perseids um, in northern England, on the 12th, 13th of August, there's a full moon all night, which means the night sky is going to be quite bright and the fainter meteors will be more difficult to see. The following year, 2023, there's a crescent moon which will, won't rise till 1.45 a.m., so before then, the sky will be as dark as it can be. But the ideal viewing conditions are the night of the 13th, 12th, 13th of August 2024, when the moon will have already set um, by 10.50 the previous evening. So these are absolutely ideal viewing conditions. So when viewing a meteor shower, we want the night sky to be as dark as possible. If you're in an inner city area with a lot of light pollution, you'd be lucky even to see 15 meteor showers, 15 meters an hour, if you could see the entire sky. We want the sky to be unobscured, so we've got a full view, no trees, buildings, etc. It's actually better not to view through a telescope or binoculars unless they're really wide angle binoculars. The reason for this is meteors can come anywhere in the sky and a telescope just focuses on a small area, so you'd be unlikely to see anything through a telescope. Obviously, we need to check the weather forecast. If it's going to be cloudy, you're not going to see anything. Look in a northeasterly direction, but probably the most important thing is meteors are not predictable, so you need to be patient and wait. If you're lucky enough to live in a rural area with little light pollution, the best thing to do is sit back in a deck chair for a few hours and just relax and watch the meteors come. So when it comes to photographing meteor showers, you want a camera with a short focal length lens giving a wide field of view. A 50 millimeter focal length lens will typically give a 40 degree field of view, so you've got a good chance of seeing something. The other thing to consider is where you point the camera. Tracks are actually longer further away you go from the radiant.
Um, the other thing to do is to set the camera to take multiple short exposures of say 30 seconds in length. Most of these won't contain a meteor, but some of these will. Uh, or you could use a simple smartphone app such as Nightcap, which is available on the iPhone, which I'll talk about in a minute. But probably the most important thing, once again, is patience. And if you're really lucky, you'll catch a beautiful image such as this. Nightcap is an iPhone app, which is widely used for nighttime photography. It has a meteor mode, which automatically takes photos around 720 per hour with a five second exposure time and then automatically scans them and only saves photos it thinks might contain a meteor. The number of photos it saves depends on many factors. Clear skies are obviously ideal. It generally saves between about 4% and as high as 30% of all photos. If you've got busy skies with lots of aircraft, it will result in more photos being saved. I'll now go through some of the results from Nightcap. It's easy to tell the difference between meteors, satellites and planes with the naked eye. Planes move slowly across the sky unless they're at very low at altitude and have flashing lights. Satellites move slowly too, but don't flash. They look a little bit like a moving star. Meteors are fast and short lived. It's a bit harder in photos. So here's some examples. This is a plane at low altitude. The flashing lights on the wings paint dashed lines in the photo, making it easy to spot. This is a plane at high altitude. Once again, the flashing lights on the wings paint these dashes. A faint satellite can look a little bit like a meteor, but the faint satellite has the same brightness all the time. Another thing with satellites is the track will continue over multiple images. The image on the left is a small meteor. The short streak with the bright head and the fainter tail give it away. The one on the right is a brighter meteor. It's clearly brighter at one end and you can clearly see the tail fading away. And if you're really lucky, you'll capture one of these. This is a fireball, a big, bright meteor. It has a bright tail and ends with a flash as it explodes.